Good afternoon, everyone, and I hope you had an enjoyable Labor Day weekend. Thank you for joining the anorexic rabbit with Dr. Andrew Bean. I'm today's moderator, Nicole Cast, the CE program manager for the MVMA. If you have any questions during the session, please type them in the Q&A area. I know many of you are familiar with WebEx, but for those who are newer to MVMA or have just joined a lunch and learn for the first time, I'd like to give you just a brief session uh, of what to do. So if the panel hasn't already appeared for you, place your cursor on the screen and on the bottom, you'll see a series of action circles. Look for the black circle with the three dots and click on it and you'll see Q&A option. Click on the Q&A and a window will appear so you can begin typing your question or response and then click send. I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Andrew Bean received his veterinary degree from the University of Minnesota in 2011 with an emphasis on small animal and companion exotic animal medicine and surgery. Dr. Bean earned a Master's of Public Health in 2014 and became board certified in exotic companion mammal practice in 2019. He has worked in zoos, primary care practices, and emergency facilities around the country, settling in Virginia Beach for six years prior to his return to Minnesota, where he currently works for AERC. Please go ahead, Dr. Bean. Thank you, <laughs> thank you very much, and thanks to everyone for for joining us for this talk. We're gonna be talking about, well, the clinical approach to the anorexic rabbit. So let's get started. A brief outline of how we're going to be tackling this, uh, this lengthy subject in the span of about an hour. We'll, we're gonna be talking about triaging the anorexic rabbit and then get some, uh, tackle the specific history stuff you wanna look into uh, at the beginning of the case. Little tips as to how to approach the physical exam. A brief mention of sedation. I could spend a whole talk about sedation in, in exotic companion mammals alone, but um, we're gonna touch on it briefly. Then we'll get into diagnostics and of course therapy. Some key points that, uh, that I would like folks to take away from, uh, from this talk. Uh, what are the key physiologic values, or what is the key physiologic value to assess during triage of the anorexic rabbit? What are the indicators of pain in rabbits? What diagnostic test is essential for anorexic rabbits? And finally, what is the appropriate dose of meloxicam in rabbits? So bear these in mind as we go through uh, through the presentation, and after we've uh, and, and I'll circle back to them periodically for you too. But the, these are like the really, uh, some of the key points that I would like folks to take away. So triage, this is kind of what we're facing with, <laughs> with rabbits in our practice. You got, uh, because they're so stoic, they're prey animals, they tend to hide this, uh, their, the signs of their disease until things get really advanced. Um, and so you have the, this is kind of the the exaggerate the hyperbolic stereotype, um, but there is a difference between the two. A stable rabbit is going to be bright and alert. Is going to be curious about its surroundings. It may be trying to get away from you or just moving around the room, periscoping and uh, doing cute bunny things. It should have normal respiratory effort. It might be sniffing. It might be uh, it might be breathing fast because it's a stressed rabbit. But it shouldn't. Uh, but its effort should not be exaggerated. Contrast this with the unstable rabbit. It's going to be quiet. It's going to have glazed eyes, and it's going to uh, have plus or minus oral tightening, which is fancy medical talking for squinting. Um, it's not going to be interacting with its surroundings. You know, the, uh, a, a, a rabbit is a prey animal. It, if it is in this, what it believes to be a hostile setting, uh, to not be interacting with its surroundings is, uh, is to say that it doesn't care, which is highly unusual. Uh, it will be relatively easy to handle, although even an unstable rabbit may try and get away from you. And it will have increased respiratory effort. Rabbits are primarily diaphragmatic breathers rather than uh, rather than using their intercostal muscles. So you're going to see that increased respiratory effort uh, in their abdominal movements. 
physiologic variables to assess on triage. So temperature, it, we're, uh, like TPR here, this is not, nothing new, but normal temp in a rabbit, the, the, you can find as many reference ranges for temperature as you can sources on this. But the one that I typically use is from a paper about five, uh, five six years ago. So 100.4 to 103.8. Need to take this rectal, go in a couple of centimeters, uh, and the danger area is when you start getting attempts below 99 degrees. Now, uh, there was one study, actually the study that uh, established this reference uh, that showed that for every 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit uh, below 100.2, the odds ratio of death doubled. And there was another more recent study that showed that rabbits presenting for anorexia and lethargy if their temperature on presentation was less than 97.9, the odds ratio of death was about five times that of the other rabbits. So, uh, so this is a pretty important uh, physiologic variable to assess. Heart rate, normal heart rate is about th uh, two to 300, depending on the size and stress level. So I, I had a continental giant in my office uh, last week, uh, his heart rate was it's about like 160, and that's a big rabbit. So I'm okay with that. But if I was dealing with a little, uh, with a little dwarf rabbit with a heart rate of 150, that would be that would be concerning to me. Uh, so, uh, but danger levels, you know, subjectively, heart rate greater than 380 or less than 120. Kind of take this within the context of your patient. Normal rest break is technically 30 to 60, but so often when we see bunny patients in the hospital, they're just going to be sniffing or doing the rapid respirations. So you really need to examine the respiratory effort that they're making to breathe. So danger signs would be open mouth breathing or visibly exaggerated respiratory movements. Key point, first one. What is the key physiologic variable to assess during triage? And that would be the rectal temperature. Low end of normal is 100.4, and the lower the temp, the worse the prognosis. And also, tell, uh, so you can communicate with your owners about how aggressive you need to be in the therapy. Moving on to history, what sort of questions should we be asking owners? Diet is a big one. So percentage of hay pellets and veggies that they feed their buns, and have there been any sudden changes? Just like when you're dealing with a dog or cat, if there's been a, a, a sudden dietary shift, that can cause some alteration of the GI flora and uh, subsequent disease. And God knows that bunnies uh, rely heavily on their GI flora. When we're talking pellets, we wanna know, are they feeding just extruded pellets or is it a mix and mixed with what? Is, uh, is it seeds? Is it uh, different shapes of pellets? Is, uh, are there little fruit bits in there? What, what's it mixed with? Uh, what brand is it? If, uh, so uh, usually I will ask clients what brand they're feeding and then uh, just do a quick Google of, uh, of it to get a better idea of what's being fed and amount. Uh, so people will uh, will often say they know that you know, that a rabbit should eat about 75% hay. And so they might tell you their uh, the, per, uh, the loose percentages just subjectively, but they might not tell you what the um, uh, what the actual amount they're feeding is. So like if they're, if they're feeding two cups of pellets a day, that's way too much. Uh, the amount here is key. Uh, when we when we get to hay, we want to know what type of hay. Are they feeding alfalfa or is it a grass hay and what type of grass hay? Their source or brand, are they feeding, uh, you know, something that they buy at the pet store? Are they going to the feed store and getting a bale? And, uh, and what's the quality of it? How often is it changed out? The different parts of of the hay uh, of, of the hay plant taste different to rabbits. So some rabbits will only like the leaves or only like the seeds. And so uh, the owners might uh, so with fresh hay, the rabbit might you know go to town on it in, initially. But then once it's eaten through all the stuff that it likes, it might just leave it sitting there. So kind of uh, needle in on this one. How often are you changing that hay? 
And how is it offered? Is it, uh, uh, is it offered in a rack that's kind of hard to reach? Is it offered in a pile? How are you giving it to them? And you know, how much does the rabbit eat? Treats, what kind of treats are you feeding? Uh, are, is it like a compressed hay based treat, which are, which I like, or are, are they feeding, you know, high sugar, high uh, stuff like yogis? Um, and what amount are they feeding and frequency uh, really treats very rarely for uh, is what I recommend a couple of times a week. And nutritional supplements, these are becoming more uh, more trendy in the rabbit community. So just want to know what they're giving. Uh, also, their water, how are they providing it? So is it in a water bottle or is it uh, in a bowl? Rabbits evolve drinking out of puddles of water or uh, uh, drinking it off of leaves. They're not accustomed to drinking it out of sipper bottles. And what evidence we have about uh, captive held rabbits is that they tend to prefer it out of a bowl. And what's the source of their water too? Outdoor exposures we want to know about, especially as rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus makes its way across the US. Uh, we want to know about exposures to other animals and other stressors in the home, construction, visitors, uh, that sort of thing. Behavior changes that the owner might have noticed recently can provide useful information. Stomping rabbits stomping is a sign of uh, of fear and alarm. They're trying to uh, they're trying to alert members of their uh, uh, other rabbits and their family that danger is nearby. Hiding uh, ataxia is uh, might not be picked up on unless you uh, ask people about it. Change in litter box habits are they uh, are they suddenly now peeing outside of the box? Um, are they dropping their food? And is or have there's is there a change in food preferences? Well, he's still eating his hay, but he's not eating his pellets anymore. And so those two, uh, the dropping food and change in food preps, would suggest a dental problem. Moving on to the physical exam. Uh, so eyes, key things to look at with the eyes: orbital tightening, uh, so squinting, which is a sign of pain. Discharge. Look for nystagmus, of course, and anisocoria. Um, and the corneal and palpebral reflex. I, I see a fair amount of, of middle ear infections in rabbits and they, those can cause uh, facial nerve paralysis. So if you're looking, uh, so if you suspect that, just, it, you should, uh, a rabbit should blink when you try and do a corneal reflex, when you try and touch the globe. Uh, they should blink when they do that. Palpebral, they, they're, they have a pretty strong uh, freeze response, so you might only get a partial one with a palpebral reflex, but you should still get one. This is orbital tightening. This is from some research, uh, some research done out in the UK. So on the left here, we've got uh, the the two the column on the left it shows a rabbit with uh, normal uh, no orbital tightening. This rabbit is not painful. The middle column, this is uh, this is like a moderate amount of orbital tightening. You can see the rabbit starting to squint. And then uh, the right hand column, the, uh, the rabbit's eyes are barely open. This is a rabbit that's in a lot of pain. And this, oh, by the way, uh, you can uh, look up rabbit grimace scale online. I'm going to take a few pictures from that, but this information is freely available and really good stuff. I send it home with clients. Ears, so are they lop or erect ears? Uh, and I pal uh, you can palpate their pulse with the central auricular artery. I, uh, rabbits hate hate having their back legs messed with. So this is where I get my bunny pulses, not, not with the femoral ar artery. I use the central auricular artery. Um, uh, palpate the base of the of the external ears and the tympanic bulla uh, because uh, because we can find a lot of disease here, especially in the lop-eared rabbits with um, uh, otitis externa and otitis media. Ear position and shape. So what I mean by this is ear position and shape can tell you about is the rabbit painful. So just like in the last picture. Uh, we've got the, the column on the left here. This is uh, this is a rabbit that's not in pain. Ears are erect. They are fully kind of spread out. Uh, the middle column. This is m uh, like moderate uh, moderate cur uh, pinning them back and kind of cur uh, curling the uh, the actual pinna into more of a uh, more of a scroll shape. 
And then on the right, we've got ears that are pinned flat back against uh, against the dorsum and are really curled up. So that rabbit's in a lot of pain. Again, this is a rabbit grimace scale here. Nose and face. This is, uh, so of course you wanna look at the nose for discharge, but symmetry. So a facial nerve paralysis, I pretty commonly see because of otitis media. Um, and so where you can really pick up on it is if you look the rabbit straight in the face and see if one side is, is, is uh, contracted. The position of the nares is, all, uh, is also going to be important for determining the pain. See here. So more rabbit grimace scale stuff. On the left here, the uh, the nares have kind of a U shape. They're not drawn back. Uh, it's kind of a relaxed position. The middle one, we're starting to get them drawn upward, and we get more of a V than a U. And then on the right hand side, we got a very tight V here. And then from uh, from the side, you can see that uh, that the top point of the nares on the right side there is going to be is much higher than if you look over on that first picture mouth we want uh, first we want to uh, look at the incisor position and shape um, and assess the pig teeth uh, the peg teeth too lift up the lip look at them from the side or, uh, and so you can see, you sh normally you shouldn't see much. That's where the uh, the mandibular incisors include is with the peg teeth. Uh, but if you if there is some overgrowth, you should start to see it. Um, move the mandible laterally to screen for resistance and reactivity. So move the jaw side uh, side to side. And if that rabbit is really reactive, that suggests some some dental is issues palpation of the jaw so the ventral mandibular cortex can be a really useful thing to feel in a lot of our uh, uh, hindgut fermenters who are um, who have hypsodont cheek teeth so that are uh, that are constantly growing elodont uh, i actually just had a chinchilla today with severe dental disease and you feel the ventral mandibular cortex of the mandible and the poor things uh, reserve crowns are just popping through the jawbone, uh, and it can be pretty striking in some cases, and pretty, uh, pretty uh, um, subtle in other cases. Uh, and what can be useful is if you go to skullsunlimited.com and get yourself a rabbit skull. And if you're ever unsure about what it should feel like, you can pop out your skull and feel along that cortex and see if, like, hmm, is that normal or not? The other place is the alveolar bulla, where a lot of the reserve crowns of the mac uh, maxillary cheek teeth reside, is going to be just inferior to the zygomatic arch. So uh, palpating in that area is, can be informative too. Your intraoral assessment, uh, remember that the awake exam is superficial. You're not gonna get a truly detailed uh, oral exam without anesthesia. You can use an otoscope cone or a bivalve nasal speculum. This is a picture of a bivalve nasal speculum right there, it attaches to the uh, to your uh, otoscope handpiece. Um, look at the height, the symmetry of the teeth. The way I do this, uh, so like the method to my madness, if you if you're using the uh, the bivalve nasal speculum. If you just go in there and uh, go in the middle and you spread uh, spread the wings of the speculum all the way, you're pretty much just going to see tongue. Uh, so what I do is I'll do uh, I'll look at one side. I'll I'll stick the uh, stick the speculum in on one side of the incisors and then just spread the wings uh, gently until I'm able to visualize the uh, the cheek teeth but the tongue isn't is still being pushed out of the way and then i'll move to the other side and look at the other cheek uh, other side of the cheek teeth and then uh and then i'll kind of go in the middle and give it a big spread, and that is going to let uh, to let me do uh, uh it's going to let me see the tongue and the buccal mucosa that's as long as the bunny is uh, is chewing. So if the bunny isn't chewing, then you're just going to be looking at their incisors. Uh, so it, uh, in, if that's the case, you have to go to either side of the incisors and just kind of look around that way. Uh, this is some of the stuff that you can find. This guy on the left here, he's got uh, 
a primary malocclusion with this with his uh, mandibular incisor uh, overgrowing. The other one is fractured. This uh, was um, this is a patient I saw during my mentorship in Virginia, and some really striking changes. Obviously, the upper left second premolar is severely overgrown, and you can see that uh, there there's some chronic damage, almost um, callus formation to the buccal mucosa right there. Um, the uh, the uh, the right mandibular cheek teeth are also you, uh, you've got some point formation down here that's a bit more exaggerated um, and moving up to the uh, to the uh, upper left uh, arcade of the cheek teeth you can see there's kind of an irregularity to the uh, height of the occlusal plane so all things that you can see. Um, uh, potentially on an awake oral exam. It, it, in this case, this was taken on a sedated patient, an anesthetized patient. All right, auscultation. Uh, remember that the thorax of rabbits is much smaller than carnivores, so you just have less uh, area to move around with your stethoscope. There, I have a technique for counting heart rates uh, because heart rates in exotics can get pretty fast. One, uh, the thing that I usually do is I count in groups of 10 over six seconds and I multiply by 100. What that looks like, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 2, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 2, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And then I just, uh, over six seconds, I, uh, uh, I just fig figure that out. So I counted, let's say, uh, 3.2 uh, uh, groups of 10. So the heart rate is, uh, is 320. Uh, the, the other option is counting groups of four multiplied by 40, one EANA, two EANA, three EANA, four EANA, five EANA, six EANA. Um, uh, that, that flows better than trying to do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, but um, I learned that later, and so that's, uh, that's, I'm less comfortable with it. So I usually just do the first one, but whatever works for you. Referred upper airway sounds are common and, uh, and can be uh, can mask murmurs and for uh, and can all you can also confuse them for murmurs because because uh, sometimes you got a bunny who's breathing at the same rate as his heart is beating and so you need to kind of distract them or uh, or uh, kind of get those two the the periods of the breathing and the heartbeat to stop syncing up so uh, so well so you can uh, pick one out from the other. And lack of crackles does not exclude the presence of fluid in the chest. The, just a little pointer that uh, it, as our patients get smaller when it comes to mammals, uh, it, uh, the sensitivity of our thoracic auscultation uh, gets worse. So, uh, and even with a rabbit, uh, you can uh, even it, you, they can have pleural effusion, pulmonary edema. Even if there are no crackles, they uh, they can still have it. So remember that. Abdominal palpation, the uh, knowledge of anatomy is essential. So uh, get some books, refer to them, or do some necropsies. This uh, uh, this was a um, a necropsy I was doing in Virginia, and so I I took this picture right after I opened it up because I wanted to uh, like. This is what uh, things look like when you first open things up. So um, we have, let's see. Right. All right, so right about here is going to be the, uh, the ileocecal colic junction with the sacculus rotundus. Then, uh, then this area right here, this is the colon, the cecum, this is the first gyrus of the cecum, and it's uh, curving around underneath over here. So first, uh, uh, first gyrus, second gyrus, third gyrus up here, and then actually from here, it's going to curve around back this way, uh, uh, dorsal to the intestines. That's where the appendix is. Um, okay, let's stop the annotating. Um, pain may be subtle when you're uh, when you're uh, doing the palpation. Maybe you just see a little tremor where they're uh, where they're painful, where they're moving away. They might have reluctance to move when they sh uh, when they should be moving. If you're feeling something that's really enlarged, like a, a big old stomach or uh, 
or a bladder and they should be moving, but they're not, might be because they're so painful. You might feel some tensing, although a stressed rabbit can do that too. Squinting is, of course, something uh, that you would note, the orbital tensing. You want to pick up on the size of the stomach, any gastric dilation, and is it fluidy? Is it firm with, uh, with, uh, with just uh, ingesta? And the cecum, do you feel gas? Uh, do you feel just fluid? Uh, fluid is normal for the cecum. Gas is not. Um, and can you feel it at all? Uh, if the if we got a uh, rabbit that's been anorexic for a long time, you can have an empty cecum, and that's not good. You should uh, you could, should palpate for the liver right underneath the rib cage. You shouldn't be able to feel much, and if you can feel a substantial amount of liver, that uh, that is abnormal uh, and might be further investigated. Skin, normal skin tint doesn't always mean normal hydration status. Uh, just assume that an anorexic rabbit is at least 5% dehydrated. They carry such a, such a large amount of fluid in their uh, gastrointestinal tract that they can have a normal skin tint, but, uh, but a huge wad of dehydrated ingesta in the stomach that, uh, that's just sitting there. So, uh, so fluids are going to be important for the anorexic rabbit, as we'll talk about. Um, unkempt fur, seborrhea sicca, fecal matting can all suggest dental disease. Finally, body condition score, there is the rabbit seismometer or seismometer. Uh, this is available online uh, at the UK, the Pet Food Manufacturers Association in the UK. And uh, rabbits that are overweight or obese are more likely to have, uh, to have problems with anorexia and decreased fecal production. So key point, what are some of the physical indications of pain in rabbits? Orbital tightening is one of the big ones that, uh, and across species that is commonly seen. Ears pinned back and kind of uh, folded into a scroll. Nose pulled up and back. Tremoring on palpation and reluctance to move when you're palpating something that is painful. And diagnostics. So moving on to, to okay, we got this rabbit in the hospital. We triaged it. We've uh, we've done our physical exam. Now we need to work it up. Our tools in the uh, in the in the in the tool chest here. Of course, the CBC chemistry UA anesthetized oral exam, abdominal radiographs, thoracic radiographs, abdominal ultrasound. Other stuff that can, but I'm not really going to uh, touch on a lot. Blood lactate blood gas analysis if you have that, computed tom tomography, and of course, MRI. When you're getting your diagnostic tests, it's really, uh, this is where I sedate a lot of my patients, especially uh, rabbits, um, even healthy rabbits when I'm getting, when I'm getting blood from them. Uh, during my mentorship, I had a, uh, uh, just as a practice, there was, uh, we had a non-zero number of rabbits wellness rabbits that we were getting wellness blood work on, they kicked and they broke a leg or they broke their back. And so uh, and so just because, uh, because of that and because uh, a lot of sedatives uh, are quite safe in rabbits, sedate them, it's going to blunt their, pain, uh, their prey response and make them easier to handle. So they have strong flight response and, res uh, and result in catecholamine release. Th that catecholamine release can uh, can cause substantial coronary vasoconstriction and may lead to death. So you know that st the stereotype of the rabbit that presents and then just dies. Part of that is because uh, maybe because of that catecholamine release. They literally uh, don't have adequate blood flow to the heart and they code. So that uh, that is uh, so we need to blunt this response. Sedation is great for this. Anxiolysis and blunting the flight response. Midazolam, quarter mg per kg to one mg per kg. Quarter mg per kg I'll use, uh, use in a pretty unstable rabbit um, in order to, to just provide some mild restraint. I'll, I'll even go lower sometimes depending on the case. But, um, and then one mg per kg is, my, is like my systemically healthy rabbit dose. Higher doses have been studied. There, there was one study that looked at two mg per kg. Um, so it's a drug that has quite a wide, 
safety, uh, degree of safety when you use it. Um, Butorphanol, 0.2 to 0.5 mg per kg, you can, uh, uh, if you need it, you're going to get more, uh, you're going to get some cardiopulmonary depression with, uh, with butorphanol compared to midazolam. Uh, you may also get hypothermia, hypoxemia when coupled with midazolam too. So if you're, if you're just doing a, a wellness and the bunny isn't too jumpy, uh, then midazolam. And if you're, uh, but if, if you're dealing with a really jumpy bunny, you can use some Torb. Um, the, uh, if you've got a really critical patient, I still, I still will give a low dose of midazolam just so that they, uh, because even though they might not be moving as much, they're still perceiving things. And so I just want to, just want to help them help ease their anxiety. Okay, now we are talking about diagnostics here. So uh, the mainstays of diagnostics for the anorexic rabbit, radiography, key. Uh, Abdominal radiography always thoracic, if indicated. Of course, a lot of folks are going to get a bunny gram, uh, and that you know, you, there's nothing that's not a bad thing. I uh, I like to do, I like to get the most out of my tests that I can, and so you kind of play it. Uh, use your judgment. Are you going? Do you want to see potentially more detail by collimating in your study? Um, uh, and using appropriate technique, uh, so like just doing the abdomen, or do we uh, do we really need to? Uh, are we dealing with a relatively unstable rabbit, and we just uh, and maybe there are some respiratory signs, but mm, not strikingly so. And let's just get the thorax in there too. CBC and chemistry are also are a mainstay of uh, workup of the anorexic rabbit. Radiography, like I said, this is the essential diagnostic test for anorexic rabbits. Helps with localizing the problem to primary versus secondary GI disease, uh, and helps you diagnose obstructive versus hypokinetic patterns, ileus or stasis, whatever you want to call it, and it provides important prognostic information. So here are some examples. This is kind of your, your typical ARGIS, rapid gastrointestinal syndrome, or GI stasis. Uh, X-ray. You've got um, mild to moderately enlarged stomach with uh, with a heterogeneous ingesta. Um, the uh, is subjectively, you've got reduced cecal contents, uh, and we've got some water. Uh, uh, we do have the, the descending colon, which is a little unusual. Uh, and this bunny has quite a bit of peritoneal fat and retroperitoneal fat, so we've got good. Uh, good contrast too. Contrast. Uh, so speaking of contrast, contrast th these X-rays with this. This is your classic obstructed rabbit X-ray. You've uh, the stomach. You've got. Hold on. Let me turn on my annotations here. Stomach is very distended. Right here. There. It, uh, it's not heterogeneous. It, uh, there's just kind of this uniform fluid opacity with the central gas bubble. This is classic. This is, uh, this is an upper GI obstruction. Um, still have heterogeneous ingesta in the uh, in the cecum. Uh, and you can see that on the other one. So, and now uh, for comparison's sake, we can also look at this. This is uh, this is bad news bears right here. It, it's really useful for looking at the anatomy of the rabbit GI tract. But uh, like widespread dilation of uh, of the GI tract, the stomach, the cecum, the small intestine, and the colon are all outlined here, and you can really see these uh, uh, these tenia right here in the cecum. It's really kind of cool, but not good for the rabbit. When you see something like this, this uh, this is going to indicate uh, either uh, well, in this case, this is severe ileus, likely dysbiosis. Uh, this is a poor prognostic sign. Looking at your CBCs, some uh, some pointers uh, when you're looking at them. Red blood cells, anisocytosis, and polychromasia is common. Typically, one to two percent of red blood cells. But if I send out a profile and I get it back and it says one plus anisocytosis, that's normal. It's not regenerative. 
Uh, rabbit leucograms, normally they are primarily lymphocytic species with a, uh, with a ratio of heterophils to lymphocytes of one to one or less. So the, uh, the lymphocyte, kind of like a cow, is the predominant leukocyte. Uh, there is some variation in the total white cell count with circadian rhythms, so like the time of day, also the time of month. Uh, the rabbit's nutritional status or any deficiencies, its sex and its breed. An inflammatory leukogram in a rabbit is different than a dog or cat. You often have a normal total white blood cell count, but a shift in the population. So you've got a uh, at least a two to one heterophil to lymphocyte ratio. Um, you, uh, and if you do have an elevated total white blood cell count, that suggests substantial inflammation. So. Um, uh, so if it's even if it's mild, that's significant, especially if it's accompanied by um, uh, by that change in the ratio of hets to lymphs. You can see stress leukograms, so put it in the context of your patient, and always perform a differential. That's really important, um, especially because oh, maybe these. Uh, yeah, because we're dealing with a normal total white blood cell count, you know, like, uh, but an inflammatory head to lymph ratio. Um, you want to check out, you want to look for toxic change. Also, analyzers, I found that uh, a lot of analyzers will sometimes stumble over what's a heterophil and what's an eosinophil, because they both have eosinophilic um, uh, uh, granules that uh, they, they're shaped uh, they're shaped differently they're different sizes but even even so the uh, the automated analyzers can sometimes have a problem with them uh, chemistry if I, if you see a high ALT you should be considering a liver lobe torsion which are relatively common in rabbits normal does not rule it out. There's been one retrospective study, and uh, I think 87% of cases had a high ALT, not all of them. Uh, so, but if you do have a high ALT, ALT, and I don't just mean like 130, I mean like uh, you know, three, four, five, six hundred more. Um, some other prognostic information, uh, rabbits with a sodium level of less than 129 in one study had a 2.3 greater risk of death, so odds ratio of uh, mortality 2.3, so that's significant. Looking at glucose, one study uh, looked at uh, its prognostic usefulness. They found that uh, blood glucose of greater than 360 indicates severe abdominal pain and a poor prognosis. Greater than 444, the, the authors will say cons, uh, was consistent with obstruction. Uh, and, you know, it's, I, I'd say it's suggestive the way that they, that they diagnosed obstruction uh, was not, was not an absolute way. So, but, uh, hyperglycemia, that, uh, that degree of hyperglycemia in any rabbit is generally a poor prognostic indicator. Uh, also, a, um, uh, a BUN of higher than 25 had, uh, uh, in one study just published a couple of years ago, those bunnies had a three times greater risk of death. So this is all stuff that as you're getting your initial labs back, can help you determine how am I going to manage this case. So, key point number three, what diagnostic test is essential for the anorexic rabbit? It is, of course, abdominal x-rays. Uh, they provide critical information on treatment and prognosis, and uh, this is really the place to start. Treatment, hey, what do you know? Uh, main treatment considerations uh, for anorexic rabbit, restore normal volemia. Recall that I was talking about how these guys have such a large amount of uh, fluid in their gut, even if you've got a bunny with moist mucous membranes and, uh, uh, and a normal skin tent, that bunny's GI, and, uh, GI contents are probably dehydrated. So using fluids is going to be important. Control your pain you, and use all, all the modalities. Provide thermal support because, as we discussed earlier, a lot of rabbits are going to present uh, to some degree hypothermic. And ad address comorbidities. You need to perform diagnostics. GI stasis has uh, was in the last 10 years or so been renamed 
rabbit gastrointestinal syndrome or ARGIS. And that's because uh, to, to really emphasize that this is a syndrome. It is not a diagnosis in and of itself. So, uh, so we need to get away from a definitive diagnosis of GI stasis because uh, it's like congestive heart failure. Congestive heart failure because of what? Um, there's, uh, there are things you can do to con treat congestive heart failure, but let's look at what's causing it. Same with, uh, same with ARGIS. We need to do diagnostics to figure out what is causing it. Uh, fluid therapy planning rabbit maintenance fluids. It's, it's 100 to 150 mils per kg per day. And estimate dehydration just like you would in, uh, in a dog or cat. Assume any rabbit, uh, anorexic rabbit is at least 5% dehydrated. Your, sele your route selection, mild dehydration, you're gonna be okay with sub-Q fluids. Worse than mild dehydration, you wanna have some vascular access. Cephalic vein, marginal auricular vein, uh, and the lateral saphenous veins are, are the veins that we often use for, uh, for vascular access. Um, uh, people sometimes uh, say, well, do you, are you ever worried about ear tipped necrosis, pin, uh, pin and necrosis with using an ear vein? Um, I'm really not. Uh, that's more of a risk if you're using the artery, but uh, with a vein, I can tell you that in the UK, they are using ear veins left and right and rarely have a problem. So I, I, I would go ahead and use them. If you can't get IV access and, uh, and your patient really needs, needs, uh, needs vascular access, then it's time to go IO catheter. Uh, the places I like to go are the proximal femur, the proximal tibia. I think for a rabbit, it's a bit more comfortable for them to have uh, if they're going to be, if you're not just using it for surgery to put it in the femur, uh, just because of their normal stance, it's less, uh, less intrusive. I prefer to use spinal needles, a 22 gauge inch and a half spinal needle. Um, those are a bit expensive. So uh, you can also use a hypodermic needle. You can use, uh, so, uh, you can make an improvised stylet with some K wire. Uh, or I know like Angela Lennox, she likes to use the hypodermic needle and if she gets a bone plug in it, she just takes it out and puts a new one in. So, um, and props to her. I, I have tried that and, um, and I find it's difficult to, uh, to, get, uh, to get that second needle in. So I just like having the stylet in place to keep the bone plug out. Pain control, non-opioids, the lidocaine CRI is, can be really useful, and there's a, uh, there's a rate there. Meloxicam, note the, the dose here. Uh, it's one mg per kg, sub-Q or PO. N now, uh, there, if you look in the exotic animal formulary by Carpenter, you're going to see a number of different doses. You're going to see 0.2 mg per kg, Q24, 0.5 mg per kg, 1 mg per kg, um, and that uh, the, uh, the current dose of Medicam is one mg per kg. Uh, PO is, uh, has been evaluated, sub-Q uh, is, uh, we don't have PK studies on that, but um, just uh, empirically, I find it works well. Uh, and I have not had any side effects. Um, carprofen can be used. I don't use it much in rabbits because I use Medicam. But, uh, uh, and there was one study just a few years ago that, uh, that compared uh, this, uh, rabbits getting facial grafts and they looked at buprenorphine versus buprenorphine and carprofen versus uh, nothing and, they, and the, uh, there was no real difference between the buprenorphine and buprenorphine car carprofen uh, treatment groups. So that's interesting. Um, other options, meropitant um, at the standard one mg per kg dose. We only have one PK study. There's no pharmacodynamic evidence. There's anecdotal use for visceral pain. I use it. Do I do I think it works? I don't know. Um, so uh, you know, this is uh, this isn't going to be a big gun that we know of. Uh, gabapentin, 10 to 20 mg per kg, Q, uh, Q8 to 12. Totally anecdotal dose. Do I think it helps? Yeah. Do I know it helps? Helps? Nope. So uh, again, I don't use I don't use this as like my main source of pain control. Uh, 
for hospitalized cases, I do use opioids a lot. Um, uh, buprenorphine, there are your doses there. Uh, buprenorphine SR, this is a nice uh, compounded formulation through Zoo Farm, which is a compounding pharmacy, I believe, in Colorado. Um, and this one is going to, uh, this one lasts for 72 hours. Hydro, 0.1 to 0.2. Fentanyl, I use a lot of fentanyl for my surgical cases. So loading dose of 10 mics per kg, and then a CRI of 10 to 30 mics per kg. Um, so, yes, with opioids, you will see some decreased GI motility, but these bunnies that are uh, presenting in uh, Argus, uh, anorexic, no fecal production are painful. So, let's give them some pain control. Tramadol, I don't use because the, uh, uh, it's high, it has highly variable absorption in rabbits uh, on, uh, with oral administration. Uh, and it's not, it's really, I mean, what we know in dogs and cats is that it's no better than placebo. So I have no reason to think it's different in the rabbit. Key point, what is the current dose of meloxicam in rabbits? It's one mg per kg. Uh, so like I said, sub PK hasn't been described, but uh, anecdotally it's well tolerated. Uh, and really the, the study that looked at this dose uh, orally gave it to rabbits for a month. And then and they did uh, pre, intra, and post blood work, and then they necropsied all of them, and there were no significant uh, abnormalities that could be attributed to the Medicam. So I really think this is uh, like, this is, the, uh, this is the dose that you need to, to really get to uh, serum levels that are considered analgesic in dogs and cats. Do we know that they're analgesic in rabbits? No, that's the next step. But um, at this point, this is the current dose. And, uh, and there was one study comparing, uh, comparing uh, uh, a high dose versus a 0.2 mg per gig, and they found that, uh, that a high dose was more effective uh, controlling pain than, um, than 0.2 mg per gig. Thermal support uh, for our hypothermic patients, warm forced air is best for increasing body temp. Convective heating, like with a bear hugger. Um, heated caging helps support the body temp, but if you really need to get that uh, bunny's temperature up, then bust out the bear hugger. IV fluid warmers may be useful. The slower the fluid rate and the farther the warmer from the patient, the more uh, time uh, the fluids have to cool before they reach the patient. So um, I don't routinely use them. Uh, when I was in my mentorship, I used them some, but again, this, uh, they, they were more of like a a nice bonus, not the key make or break factor. Sub-Q fluids should be warmed for before administration. Warming the fluids prior to IV administration, unless you're giving a bolus, is not important. So some uh, now talking about some, what about this? What about that? Uh, that uh, uh, things that folks do to manage uh, anorexic rabbits. Gastric decompression, if you have, uh, so that, uh, the X-ray of the rabbit with an upper GI obstruction. We need to gastric. It, 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 we need to do some gastric decompression. Uh, take a, a sedate the rabbit. Pass a 12 to 14 French red rubber tube um, uh, through the oral cavity. Fenestrate it with a three, a three millimeter punch biopsy. Give it a bunch of holes in there so that uh, because if you don't, then it's probably just going to get obstructed with some food, and it's really frustrating. Um, you can put the finger in the diastema, that's the space between the incisors and the cheek teeth to keep the patient from chewing when you're passing the tube, because they can just bite it off and swallow it, and that's really not what you want. Um, and you might need to infuse a little bit of saline through the red rubber into the stomach to first break up the ingesta before you suck stuff out. What about assisted feeding? If the rabbit is stable and not obstructed, yes. Uh, fiber is a prokinetic, uh, so uh, we want to get these guys uh, get these guys pooping again. Uh, the dose depends on the brand of formula you're using. Critical care and MRI Emirate are the two big ones. Um, and if syringe feeding is is too stressful, consider placing an NG tube and get yourself some Emirate herbivore or some critical care fine grind. Uh, that's going to be the the thing to use. What about antibiotics? What about them? If and only if you have evidence of an infectious disease, and rifloxacin is not a first-line drug, 
So uh, there's uh, there seems to be this uh, continued uh, belief in exotic medicine that exotic patients have a atrial deficiency, and that's uh, and that's really just not true. Uh, so we want to we want to remember that antibiotics are not benign. They alter the GI flora. They activate resistance genes of those bacteria. And medication administration is generally stressful. You want to use the things that are likely to help. And so, if you have an infectious disease, then then yeah, use some antibiotics. I would not use Batril as my first line drug. I use uh, I use things like doxycycline and TMS as a first line drug drug in rabbits. What about prokinetics? So there is really poor evidence for the utility of prokinetics in hindgut fermenting exotic companion mammals. And we're talking both pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic studies. If you dig into the literature, then you're gonna see that, uh, that like there are some studies on like uh, in vitro isolated rabbit intestine. Uh, so like not even in the rabbit itself. But uh, uh, and the, and it does seem to have an effect, but it's uh, there really isn't good evidence for using it. The thing I uh, and the thing to keep in mind there is an under underlying reason for the rabbit not pooping, and often it's pain. So treat that underlying reason first, and if you need it, it can be added. I think I meant to say it can be added, not add can be added. But uh, like busting out the reglin is not something that I do right off the bat, and I don't even like I don't even use cisapride, um, uh, just because it, uh, I have to get it compounded, and it's just too much of a pain. What about simethicone? Yeah, it's probably not going to hurt. It's probably not going to help either. Uh, that, and the reason for that is so it's used to reduce surface tension uh, in fluid and allow gas bubbles to distribute within the ingesta, so to reduce frothy bloat. And the reason I say it's probably not going to help is because frothy bloat is typically not seen in rabbits. Uh, so is it, uh, and we really don't have any any evidence on, on its utility in rabbits aside from one report a few years ago that looked uh, that compared the ability uh, how the quality of ultrasound images um, between rabbits that were fasted rabbits that were given uh, that were given simethicone and rabbits that were fasted and given simethicone uh, and the only the only group that had a significant improvement in the image of the jejunum was uh, those that were fasted for four to six hours and were given simethicone. So, um, but that was, uh, of all the things that they looked at, the gallbladder, the liver, the kidneys, uh, and the jejunum, only the jejunum was the thing that uh, the visualization was improved. Um, dosing, by the way, is all empiric uh, in exotic companion mammals. So, uh, 20 mg per kg, 60, uh, 65 to 130 mg total, whatever. Um, it's probably not going to hurt. So, review of the key points of the lecture. We're going to be wrapping up here. Uh, what is the key physiologic value to assess during triage? And that's going to be rectal temperature. What are the indicators of pain in rabbits? Orbital tightening, flattening the ears, other things like uh, like tremoring or uh, or pulling the nose back. What diagnostic test is essential for anorexic rabbits? And that's going to be abdominal radiography. And finally, what is the appropriate dose of meloxicam in rabbits? It is one mg per kg, PO or sub-Q, Q24H. Okay, and with that, that is, uh, that is the end to the presentation. So um, I am happy to take some questions if anyone has any. Thank you, Dr. Bean. Uh, as he mentioned, if you do have any questions, please type them in the chat area. I do want to take a chance while people are uh, typing away that uh, to thank Dr. Bean for his time and sharing with us his wealth of knowledge regarding the anorexic rabbit. And I also want to thank all of you attendees. I, I know uh, many of you probably closed your clinics for an extra long weekend. So jumping on um, today, uh, probably uh, glad we were able to fit into your schedule because it's kind of like a Monday for a lot of people, I think. So I'll just. Um, don't quite have any questions at this time. Okay. Um, 
Dr. Bean, could you just speak? Are you seeing more? Do you feel as though you're seeing more rabbits um, with the pandemic, or is that not influencing the type of patient you're seeing? Uh, it's, uh, I'm pretty busy um, uh, with 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 all the things. Uh, rabbits are probably the uh, the the species I see the most of, but I think with the pandemic, I mean we're seeing. Uh, uh, I mean, there are certain things that I don't see, like non-human primates, but uh, but I've seen a dramatic increase in my caseload with the pandemic across the board. Um, and uh, and uh, and Nicole, I would second what you said about uh, thanking folks for coming out today because because y'all is busy out there. Holy <laughs> insert insert expletive here, uh, and uh, to take time out of your schedules to come hang with me on yet another virtual meeting. Um, well, I appreciate it I'm, and, I've, uh, and I hope you found it useful. I'm always happy to talk through a case uh, with folks, even if it doesn't result in a referral, it, I, don't, I don't care. Um, uh, the, so you can always drop me an email at, uh, it's my first and last name, Andrew Bean at AERCMN. Dot com and Dr. Hodling had an uh, had a question there. Nicole, can you read it? I I, I can't. I'm not sure how to bring that. Oh. Have you ever split the Malexican dose giving 0.5 mg per kg 12 hours? I feel that I've seen the occasional rabbit not comfortable for the full 24. Yeah, um, I uh, I think there is some patient var uh, variability, and so I've. Uh, I, I don't usually do that, but if uh, but if I have a patient that the owner says, you know what, he seems to uh, he seems to do better on uh, on that uh, on that Q12 hour dose, then we'll do it. I uh, so uh, like w the amount of evidence that we have behind the the meloxicam dose uh, only goes so far, and really treat the patient. Don't just go by what the study said. Another question, do you look at blood glucose for GI issues? Um, I look at it, uh, I look at it when I'm working up a, a, a case. So, yeah, I mean, I run a chemistry panel and that's, uh, that's part of the panel. Um, I don't consider it the, like, uh, the definitive uh, yay or nay as to whether this, uh, this animal has a GI obstruction. I kind of have to take all of the, all of the, I have to take all of the evidence together. Great. Do we have any other questions? Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions. So again, Dr. Bean, thank you so much for your time and everybody have a fantastic day and stay safe. Thank you all very much. And like Nicole said, stay safe and we'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.